Yeah. And we're back today we have a really good presentation from doctor in training marco pepe and uh i'm blanking out dr <laughs> sami i'm a little bit nervous for this one which is probably a weird thing because this i've done 50 of these already but uh being able to have doctors come on to Future Cannabis Project and give this information to the community, uh, it's I, I'm grateful for it. Anybody could be in my position, pointing and clicking. Uh, it's hard to get doctors. So without any delay, I'm going to dip out, and uh, Marco and Dr. Hasami are going to take it from here. Hey, thanks so much, and thanks for having us. Um, let me see about this. I'm definitely not a, an expert on uh, technology. So can you see my, uh, my screen there? So there's a lot of information here. Um, so feel free to ask questions at the end. Uh, shoot us an email if you have any further questions. Lots of this research is published. So feel free to look up the articles. Um, but what we're gonna be talking about today is a plant architecture in cannabis, um, genetic aspects that allow plant architecture in cannabis to happen and how these can tell us more about cannabis so that we can understand cannabis better. So essentially we're looking at morphological and genetic dynamics in cannabis, transcriptomic insights into leaf morphogenesis, phase transition and somatic embryogenesis. So cannabis is a multi-purpose plant with medicinal, industrial, and horticultural, uh, and also uh, recreational applications, which has resulted in cannabis getting the market high. According to Statistics Canada, in 2020, cannabis uh, production alone contributed over $8 billion to the Canadian economy. Uh, this industry has shown consistent annual growth since 2016, and currently represents around 26% of GDP derived from crop production. Not only does cannab the cannabis industry generate substantial economic benefit within Canada, but also holds immense potential for expansion into global markets to further growth. So despite the, economics, uh, the economic importance of the crop, the long history of prohibition has hindered research for decades resulting in a lack of uh, reliable peer-reviewed literature on the topic compared to other major crops. Uh, following legalization, um, there has been significant increases in uh, both the industrial uses of cannabis and um, as shown in the graph, most of the research, uh, research has focused on the medicinal and biochemical aspects. However, the, the study of cannabis biology remains in its infancy and uh, it presents a captivating frontier for exploration. To enter the frontier, uh, first it's necessary to understand the language of cannabis, which unfolds through certain heteroblastic traits and uh, morphological signs, including leaf morphogenesis related traits, uh, phase transition, 
and follow taxi, et cetera. And uh, the emergence of these different traits can be uh, deciphered and translated into a language to help us better understand cannabis. So unfortunately, uh, the translation platforms that are currently available, such as Google Translate, are not yet able to compute the language of cannabis. So understanding this language requires in-depth knowledge of developmental biology, which is currently beyond the capabilities of these platforms. Hence the key goal of this project was to translate the language of cannabis using biological approaches. So in order to do this, we first studied the developmental biology of cannabis related to the plant life cycle and the various morphological features such as leaf morphology, plant height, flower features that are associated with different stages of development. Additionally, we set out to determine the molecular landscape underlying leaf morphogenesis and uh, phase transitions in cannabis, which are variable features that are intrinsically tied to specific phases of development and precise points during the cannabis life cycle. So for a more in-depth translation of the cannabis language, we aim to elucidate the molecular developmental mechanisms responsible for cannabis phylotaxy, to provide even more comprehensive insights into the language of cannabis. We use calogenesis as a platform to study the interplay between de-differentiation, re-differentiation, and differentiation processes which are critical aspects of plant developmental biology. Uh, to achieve this, we first intended to develop a cannabis calogenesis protocol by optimizing different concentrations of plant growth regulators to maximize calogenesis in cannabis. This ultimately allowed us to determine the molecular mechanisms allowing uh, for the formation of different types of cali. So in general, there are two major categories of callus, being non-embryogenic callus and embryogenic callus. These two main types uh, can further be subcategorized into friable callus, which is callus that easily crumbles apart, and compact callus made up of uh, dense tissue. Additionally, uh, embryogenic callus can be one of the following, including shooty callus that allows shoot development, Rooty callus, which produces root, or embryonic callus, which produces somatic embryos. So now let's proceed with the first chapter, which is morphological characterization of cannabis throughout its complete life cycle. And uh, this has been published, so you can look it up down at the bottom there. So morphological characterization of crops like soybean and maize throughout their complete life cycle has led to uh, what, what we'll say uh, cultivation roadmaps. This has been achieved by studying developmental phase transitions, including subtle alterations in the characteristics of leaves, buds, and stems. And these changes are species specific and include leaf dimensions, number of leaflets, leaf marginal patterning, phylotaxy, vascular path patterning and uh, capacity for rejuvenation. Characterization of morphological changes that occur throughout the life cycle of cannabis is the preliminary step required to formulate uh, a bio biology roadmap that will ultimately lead to enhanced cultivation practices with potential to revolutionize flower yields and secondary metabolite production. So first, it should be noted that most of the studies related to morphological characterization in cannabis has focused on uh, morphological and biochemical variability among land race cannabis populations. These studies generally focus on specific growth stages in cannabis with emphasis on the flowering stage and trichome development. So really, there's a lack of focus on characterization of the morphological changes that happen throughout the complete life cycle of cannabis. However, a comprehensive study of Ryman et al. characterized morphological changes related to phase transition that occurs in cannabis. 
Uh, they determined that the phase transition uh, for for adults to pre uh, for adults to pre flower stages were characterized by the emergence of solitary flowers. Then they characterized flower development. However, the focus of this study surrounded development of cloned stem cuttings and does not really provide information to the morphological changes from seed germination to flowering. So it misses a good part of the cannabis life cycle. The lack of research to characterize, to characterize morphological changes throughout the life cycle of cannabis has resulted in certain misrepresentations. Uh, for example, while research has explored factors like leaflet number and other leaf related traits as distinct characteristics, um, critical aspects such as uh, the node at which sets leaves were harvested has often been overlooked. Thus, it's time to reevaluate the methodologies that have previously been applied and uh, explore the untapped dimensions of uh, plant morphology. So for this section, uh, we had hypotheses, uh, which included uh, changes in leaf complexity throughout the cannabis life cycle can be partially explained by phase transition. And uh, phyllotaxy will change from opposite to alternate during the phase transition uh, to the flowering stage. And we had objectives, which included, um, we wanted to characterize various morphological traits, including leaf morphology, plant architecture, and uh, flower and trichome features. So this research involved cultivating 25 uh, feminized cannabis white widow plants uh, for studying morphological changes occurring from germination to flower harvest. And we kept the plants under a controlled environment in the Phytotron here at the University of Guelph. Seeds were planted in 25 centimeter diameter pots containing promix substrates. And the temperature was maintained at 25 degrees Celsius and relative humidity was kept between 55 and 65%. Uh, percent. And in order to study uh, the natural life cycle of the plant, no pruning or training of any kind was done, um, just to make sure that we study the natural life cycle of cannabis. Uh, throughout the entire plant life cycle, morphological data included leaf arrangement, number of leaflets, leaf dimensions, leaf marginal patterning, uh, both the right and left sides. And uh, we took uh, this data from the youngest fully expanded leaf. The data collected was uh, uh, essentially we collected data from six leaves from six randomly chosen plants. And uh, if you can see up here um, in this diagram, TL is the terminal leaflet, uh, RLL is the right lateral leaflet, and then one is designates uh, the proximity to the terminal leaflet. Uh, we'll need this uh, information going forward. So throughout the entire plant life cycle, bi-weekly photos were taken of uh, six randomly chosen plants. The images were processed to determine plant height and axillary stem length. And uh, so the first true leaves had one single serrated leaflet. The second true leaves had three serrated leaflets. Um, nodes three and four produced leaves with five serrated leaflets. At node five and six, the number of serrated leaflets continue to increase, resulting in leaves with seven, L5, and nine at L6 serrated leaflets. Uh, from node six to node 13, the leaves consistently produce nine serrated leaflets each. Uh, the photo period was shifted from short day 12-12 after L12 and at which point follow taxi shifted to alternate, also at L12. The 14th true leaf had eight serrated leaflets, which suggests a trans transition phase in uh, leaflet formation. Then leaves uh, reverted to the seven serrated leaflets at L15, indicating a return to the standard odd number of leaflets, then five, then three, and then finally one serrated leaflet. Um, the main flowering was observed in L16. Um, 
with the 16th true leaf. Uh, on average, uh, the lengths of the terminal and the majority of the lateral leaflets exhibited a progressive increase from L1 to L13, followed by a general reduction in leaflet size until L25. Leaflet widths were highly variable, uh, though the average uh, widths of lateral leaflets seem to decline after the photoperiodic shift. Uh, leaflet length to width ratio was highly variable throughout the life cycle. Total leaf area began to decrease uh, after the transition to the short day photo periods. The number of leaflet serrations throughout the life cycle shows a similar trend to um, leaflet length. And uh, leaflet, sir, like the angle of serration was highly variable until around L19, where the angle increased, which coincided with uh, the leaf number decreasing from seven leaflets to five leaflets and so on. So a correlational analysis revealed significant positive correlations along, uh, among all leaf traits, except for the angle of serration. Notably, the angle of serration in both terminal and lateral leaflets exhibited significant negative correlations with all the traits. However, the angle of serration in both terminal and lateral leaflets displayed significant positive correlations among themselves. So during the growth under long day photo periods, nodes two to four exhibited uh, auxiliary buds accompanied by pairs of leaves at each node which is a uh, characteristic of juvenility. With the emergence of nodes uh, five to six, uh, two stipules were observed flanking the base of leaf pedioles, which was also observed throughout the whole plant. And this demonstrated the transition of the plant from the juvenile phase into the mature phase. Uh, with the emergence of nodes seven to 12, bracts on solitary flowers developed throughout the entire plant signifying the transition to the reproductive phase. And uh, while nodes one to 11 showed opposite leaf arrangement, node 12 was associated with alternate leaf arrangements. And this eliminated a shift in phylotaxy, which continued on all subsequent nodes. So these uh, slides show the plant growth and development throughout the complete life cycle of cannabis, including week one, week three, week five, week seven, week nine, week 10, which is when the photo period was shifted to short day, week 11, week 13, week 15, week 17, and week 19. So during the long day photo period, the plant height increased from roughly four centimeters on week one to about 81 centimeters week 10. Then under short day conditions, plant height increased to 113.62 centimeters uh, by week 19. And uh, under long day photo period, the longest secondary branch in the lower part of the plant exhibited a maximum length of 19.28 centimeters by week 10. Uh, and then to a max, uh, to a max increase to a maximum length of 25.31 centimeters by week 19 under the short day for photo period. So that's the first part of essentially this, this set of experiments. Uh, the next part of the process involves gaining transcriptomic insights into leaf morphogenesis, tra phase transition, and phylotaxy. So this experiment was basically followed up by doing RNA sequencing to further decipher the language of cannabis. Thank you so much, Marco. Okay, as Marco mentioned, the second phase of this study is about transcriptomic insights into leaf morphogenesis and phase transition in cannabis. Generally, cannabis life cycle is divided into five main stages based on morphological and physiological changes, including germination, juvenile, adult, pre-flowering or adult reproductive, reproductive phase and flowering phase. 
molecular and genetic analysis of developmental phases have shown that several independently regulated processes are involved in the normal maturation processes. These regulatory processes should be temporarily coordinated and are often coordinated through environmental signals. In general, plant development from the beginning of seed germination is accompanied by specific gene expression patterns that result in specific morphological characteristics. For instance, in Arabidopsis, the transition process, as you can see here, the transition process is categorized by an increase in the degree of serration of the leaf margin, a decrease in cell size, and changes in the trichome production in the abaxial side of the leaf lamina. Previous studies showed that several transcription factors have been identified as a as two regulators of leaf development in compound leaves. Among these transcription factors and genes, X one or NOX1 plays a central role in leaflet formation in, in uh, Arbidopsis. In passion fruit as a tree plant during the transition from juvenility to maturity, the leaf became more complex with larger leaf blade, serrated uh, margin, and the formation of new lobes. As you can see here, heteroblastic growth became apparent as the morphological pattern switched from monolobed to trilobed. NOX1, YOP, TCP, AS1, PIN, and NAM have direct function in leaf morphogenesis in passion fruits. However, studies in medica gotrancatula and peas through the production of loose of function and gain of function mutants reveal that NOX1 may not be involved in leaflet development and leaf complexity in these plants. And other genes play a crucial role in leaf complexity. Generally, medica goat truncatula can be considered one of the model plants that has been widely studied for leaf morphogenesis. This picture shows the functionally characterized genes involved in regulating the leaf morphogenesis, such as leaf size, number of leaflets, and serration in this plant. Given the wide range of leaf uh, shapes and clear developmental progression observed in cannabis leaves, cannabis can be considered a great model plant for leaf morphogenesis studies. However, there is no report in cannabis to study leaf morphogenesis. Regarding phase transition, previous studies in model plants such as Arabidopsis, reveal that the transition in the developmental phases involve subtle alteration in the characteristics of leaves, as you can see here. These changes are species specific and include leaf dimensions, number of leaflets, leaf marginal patterning, and etc. It has been well documented that the network governing the transition from juvenile to adult and from vegetative to reproductive phase, share key regulatory factors. Moreover, several of these regulatory factors influence certain heteroblastic characteristics of leaves that distinguish between these phases. It has been shown that SPL genes play an important role in the juvenile to adult transition and vegetative to flowering transition. In addition, AP2 DNA binding domains have demonstrated regulatory roles in both transition from vegetative to reproductive and also the development of flowers. In relation to cannabis, Riemann et al. demonstrated that the juvenile seedlings of cannabis gradually shift to the adult vegetative stage as confirmed by the formation of leaflets and upregulation of the phase transition genes. This switch to the reproductive stage occurs with the development of pair of single flower in the seventh node. Histological analysis indicated that transition to the reproductive stage is accomplished by the, the new establishment of new flower meristem, as you can see here, which are not presented in vegetative states, such as node 4 or node 6. Moreover, there were dramatic changes in the transcriptomic profile of flowering-related genes among node 6 and node 7. Down-regulation of flowering repressors and 
an intense increase in the transcription of phase transition related genes occurred in parallel with an increase in the transcription of flowering integrators and meristem identity genes. Considering all this information, this uh, part of the project was performed to study leaf morphogenesis and phase transition in cannabis. So for this chapter, our hypothesis was transcriptomic profiles of cannabis leaves will change as they develop from a seedling into a mature plant. And our objective was to determine the molecular landscape underlying leaf development and phase transition in cannabis. Plant material and growth condition is similar to the previous part that Marco completely explained. As seen here, leaves with different dimensions, marginal patterning, and leaflet number at different stages, such as juvenile, adult, pre-flowering, and flowering, were collected to study leaf morphogenesis and phase transition in cannabis. The youngest fully expanded leaf samples were collected at each time point, flash frozen, and stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Then total RNAs were extracted and finally, RNA libraries were sequenced and analyzed. Our results showed that a total of 18,000 genes were identified in various leaves and they expressed. Among these genes, 1,300 genes were differentially expressed. Of the differentially expressed genes, 200 genes were uncharacterized genes with unknown function. Among differentially expressed genes, 1,100 genes were differentially expressed in all leaves. We, cl we classified the leaves into two main groups, including L1 to L5, which were in the vegetative stage on the line day photoperiod. This Venn diagram shows the number of common and unique genes among these leaves. And the second group was L6 to L9, which were in the reproductive stage on their short tapered period. This Venn diagram shows the number of common and unique genes among L6 to L9. And this Venn diagram shows the number of common and unique genes between L5 leaf in the vegetative phase and L6 leaf in the reproductive phase. The top highly differentially expressed genes were involved in juvenile to adult transition flowering and leaf morphogenesis. It is notable that several genes such as flowering locusty, heading day 3A or TFS, FT interacting protein 7, SPL genes, and matbox genes display significant differential expression in leaves. These findings suggest the crucial roles of these genes in governing the transition from the vegetative phase to reproductive phase and facilitating flowering cannabis. Moreover, LRR receptor like serine threonine protein kinase genes, which play an important role in leaf morphogenesis, were among highly differentially expressed genes. The gene ontology, the gene ontology, ontology enrichment analysis of differentially expressed genes reveals that 56% of product properties of differentially expressed genes were categorized in molecular function followed by biological processes and cellular component. Based on our result, 22 differential, differentially expressed genes did direct function in leaf morphogenesis, such as leaflet formation and marginal patterning, based on studies in model plants, such as Arabidopsis, were found in our transcriptome catalog. For instance, YUP, AGO5, and TCP4, as leaflet formation related transcription factor were upregulated in compound leaves in comparison with simple leaf or L1. In addition, 24 differentially expressed genes with direct function in phase transition and flowering based on the studies in model plants were found in our transcriptome catalog. For instance, AGL42, SOC1, CAL, FT, HD3A were upregulated in L6, I mean reproductive stage, in comparison with L5, vegetative stage. Also, based on our studies, four SPL genes were differentially expressed. Generally, these findings provide valuable insights into the genetic regulation of leaf morphogenesis and phase transition in cannabis. 
In addition to leaf morphogenesis, we did RNA sequencing for phylotaxy. So the third part of this project was about transcriptomic insights into phylotactic patterns in cannabis. The arrangement of leaves encircling the stem is predominantly regulated by the shoot apical meristem and plays a significant role in determining the overall plant architecture. Leaf initiation follows a precise and organized temporal and spatial pattern rather than occurring randomly, which is known as phylotaxy. The arrangement of leaf in phylotactic pattern can be categorized into three main patterns based on the number of leaves per node. The first pattern includes one leaf per node, which can be further classified as alternate phylotaxy. The second pattern consists of two leaves per node, known as the opposite phylotaxy. And finally, warp phylotaxy can be defined as multiple leaves per node. A snapdragon is one of the model plants that has been widely studied for the phylotaxy. A snapdragon displays the opposite phylotaxy during the vegetative phase, followed by an alternate uh, phylotaxy during the reproductive phase or flowering phase. Previous studies in Snapdragon showed that auxin signaling can be considered a trigger for the gene regulatory network governing the development of alternate and opposite phylotaxy pattern. Several auxin-related genes such as PIN, auxin response factor, PLT, Yuka and LUX are functionally characterized in the context of phylotactic patterning in a snapdragon. In addition, maize has also been widely used for phylotactic studies. The ABPH1 gene encodes a cytokinin inducible type A response regulator that plays a role in determining the phylotaxy. These results suggested that cytokinin Kinin signals, in addition to opsin, are important for phylotaxy regulation in plants. However, the exploration of phylotactic pattern in cannabis remains unknown. Generally, cannabis predictably shifts from opposite to alternate, so it's a very great model for such studies. We can also reverse this and bring it from alternate to opposite by rejuvenation methods such as plant tissue culture. So this chapter investigates phylotactic pattern in cannabis, aiming to uncover the distinctive leaf arrangement patterns and their genetic functions. In this part, or hypothesis where transcriptomic profiles of cannabis leaves will change as they shift from opposite to alternate, and also interacting auxin and cytokinin dependent regulatory modules control phylotactic patterning. And our objective was elucidate the molecular developmental mechanisms responsible for phylotaxy in cannabis. Plant material and growth condition is similar to the previous chapters and parts. The youngest fully expanded leaves were harvested at node six and 11 with opposite phylotaxy and node 12 with alternate phylotaxy. Based on our results among 17,000 express genes or analysis revealed that around 7,000 genes were differentially expressed. The top highly differentially expressed genes are presented here. This includes cytochrome P450 genes, WORKI and BHLH transcription factors, which all display significant differential expression among these genes. Previous studies in other plants, such as Arabidopsis, Snapdragon, and maize, show that these genes play an important role in phylotactic patterning. This Venn diagram shows the number of common and unique genes among our samples. The most significantly enriched uh, gene ontology subcategories were observed in the domains of binding, catalytic activity, carbohydrate metabolic processes, and cellular component organization. Our results showed that a total of 50 differentially expressed genes were identified to be associated with auxin-related pathways, including auxin biosynthesis and degradation, 
oxygen transport and oxygen signal. In addition to the oxygen related genes, a total of to any eight differentially expressed genes were also identified to be associated with cytokinin related pathways. Generally, interacting oxygen and cytokinin dependent regulatory modules control shoot apical meristem function and phylotactic patterning in different plants, such as Arabidopsis, based on the gene regulatory network of phylotactic in Arabidopsis. We found homolog genes in cannabis and we suggest these regulatory networks in cannabis. Generally, the results of this study offer novel insights into the mechanisms governing phylotactic patterning in cannabis. As a summary for these parts, cannabis plants exhibit a specific leaf developmental pattern after germination. The number of serrated leaflets increase from one to nine in a node specific manner. Following this increase, the number of leaflets decrease from eight to one. Solitary flowers as a clear sign of a pre-flowering stage occur at node seven. Shift from opposite to alternate leaf phylotaxy occur at node 12. Leaf morphogenesis related genes upregulated in compound leaves compared to simple leaves. Phase transition and flowering related genes show the specific expression pattern during the shift from vegetative to uh, reproductive phase. Regarding the limitations of our study and suggestion for future perspectives, or a study utilized leaf samples. Future studies should focus on shoot apical medicine for gene expression profiling. This study concentrated on gene expression patterns without functional validation. Future investigations should include functional studies to confirm gene roles in leaf morphogenesis, phylotaxy, and phase transition. As a suggestion for future research, future research and future studies can integrate multi-omix approaches and environmental stimuli to understand uh, the complex interplay of genetic and non-genetic factors in cannabis leaf morphogenesis, phylotaxy, and phase transition. As Marco mentioned, collagenesis with its interplay of dedifferentiation, redifferentiation, and differentiation processes can be considered a great plan for, for delving into the depths of developmental biology. So we first tried to develop a collagenesis protocol in cannabis using machine learning approaches. This chapter has been published. If you are interested, you can find it in this address. Generally, collagenesis as a complex biological process is influenced by various factors such as medium composition, light, temperature, plant growth regulator, jailing agent, carbohydrate sources, and etc. All these factors can affect collagenesis rate and morphological traits of collus. Historically, micropropagation systems have been developed through serial manipulation and optimization of single factors individually, which presents challenges. If related studies continue to rely strictly on single factor optimization, the in vitro culture systems will never be truly optimized. To overcome such setbacks, different factors can be simultaneously optimized through machine learning methods to better assemble the in vitro culture puzzle. Machine learning can be considered a powerful tool not only for developing protocol, but also for better understanding of in vitro biological processes. Morphological traits of the colus, such as elongation ratio of the colus, true density of the colus, Colus roundness, colus roughness, and etc. may have correlation with the formation of different types of colus, and machine learning can be considered a great approach for understanding these types of changes. For this part of our project, our hypothesis was optimal level of oxygen and cytokinin will result in embryogenic colus production, and our objectives were evaluating the effect of plant growth regulator on colus morphological traits, using and comparing support vector machine and random forest for modeling and predicting each trait, and employing genetic algorithm as a single objective evolutionary optimization algorithm to find the optimal level of plant growth regulators for each colus morphological trait. As you can see here, 
we studied the effect of different concentration of different plant growth regulators on physic physical and morphological characteristics of different types of colus, different morphological characteristics such as colus fresh fade, area of the colus, and colus roundness, colus roughness, true density of the colus, and etc. The obtained data was used to feed different machine learning algorithms, including a random forest and support vector machine. The developed model was linked to the genetic algorithm for optimizing plant virus regulator levels to maximize embryogenic colus production. And finally, the predicted optimized results with machine learning were tested in the lab as the validation experiment. The results showed that support vector machine was more accurate than random forest based on different performance criteria. criteria. This is more visible on some traits such as PC, RC, FTC, and etc., where the predictive accuracy of the support vector machine was considerably higher than random forest model. Based on the results of support vector machine and genetic algorithm and the validation experiment, the maximum embryogenic colus production rate was obtained from MS salt medium plus B5 vitamin medium aligned with 0 0.46 milligram per liter 240 and 0.38 milligram per liter kinetin. To get transcriptomic insights into the formation of different types of colus, I mean embryogenic and non-embryogenic colus, we did RNA sequencing. So the last chapter of this project was transcriptomic profiling of embryogenic and non-embryogenic colus can provide new insight into the nature of recalcitrants in cannabis. Generally, the common notion that colus is a mass of undifferentiated cells is not completely accurate since there are different types of colus, suggesting that they are not necessarily fully dedifferentiated nor homogeneous. As Marco mentioned, we have two major group of colus, non-embryogenic and embryogenic colus. The mechanisms of gene regulation in the formation of various types of colus have been studied in different plants and several genes with different expression, including those encoding transcription factors, cell cycle regulators, and plant growth regulator related genes have been determined in different plants. For instance, genes encoding uh, leafy cutiledone or LEC1 and LEC2, BBM, AGL15, indole acetic acid, yucca, and uh, oxygen response factor play important roles in embryogenic colus formation. Epigenetic, such as histone modification, chromatin remodeling, and DNA methylation also play an important role in collagenesis and somatic embryogenesis. However, until now, there, there exists no study on global transcriptional changes and the regulation in relation to cannabis collagenesis and somatic embryogenesis. For this part of the project or hypothesis where embryogenic colus has higher expression of embryogenesis related genes and the repression of oxygen dependent pathway related genes contributes to the recalcitrant nature of cannabis. And our objectives were compare the transcriptional profiles of various types of coli and getting insight into the nature of recalcitrant nature in cannabis. The collagenesis was performed based on our previously developed protocol via machine learning, I mean last part, and different types of colus, including non-embryogenic colus, embryogenic colus, including rooty colus, and embryonic colus were all obtained uh, to a study, uh, to do an study RNA sequencing. Our results showed that around uh, 16,000 genes were expressed in all leaves. We found that 6,000 genes were differentially expressed among differentially expressed genes. As you can see, among the differentially expressed genes, 1,200 genes were uncharacterized genes, 
with unknown function. This Venn diagram shows the number of common and unique genes among different types of color. This graph shows the result of gene ontology analysis in upregulated and downregulated genes, and this graph shows the results of gene ontology analysis in embryogenic and non-embryogenic colors. Generally, 196 phytohormone-related genes differentially expressed in various types of colors. Ethylene-related genes had the highest number of differentially expressed genes, followed by auxin, cytokinin, oxazic acid, and etc. 42 different Transcription factor classes show differential expression in different types of colors, with MYB having the most abundant genes, followed by C2H2, BRF, AP2, and etc. And generally, 247 differentially expressed genes related to various epigenetic machinery, such as chromatin remodeling, DNA methylation, and histone modification, were identified. Based on the gene regulation network of somatic embryogenesis in Arabidopsis, we found homolog genes in cannabis, and this suggests this regulatory network in cannabis. Overall, our finding indicated that the expression level of gene associated with cytokine independent pathway resulted in embryogenic colors formation. However, the repression of auxin dependent pathway genes led to the suppression of somatic embryogenesis. It seems that the repression of oxygen-dependent pathway-related genes may account for recalcitrant nature of cannabis. As a summary for collagenesis parts, data modeling by machine learning can display a reliable solution to provide comprehensive knowledge on collagenesis. The hybrid SVM, support vector machine, and GA, genetic algorithm, could precisely predict and optimize collagenesis identified notable differences in gene expression profiles in various types of colors, the significance of epigenetic regulation in determining the developmental fate of cannabis colors, and the repression of oxygen-dependent pathway-related genes may contribute to the recalcitrant nature of cannabis. Well, regarding limitations of our study and suggestions for future studies, Future studies should assess the suitability of our developed model uh, and the optimized media in collagenesis of other commercial drug type and fiber type of cannabis. Recommended future research efforts to establish a more robust and reproducible embryogenic system in cannabis to ensure the validity of results. This study concentrated on gene expression patterns without functional validation. Future investigations should include functional studies to confirm gene rules in somatic embryogenesis. And as a suggestion for future research, future studies can use epigenetic approaches to understand the role of different epigenetic machineries in the formation of different types of colors. But as a general result, in this study, we try to develop a roadmap for the cultivation of cannabis based on our developed roadmap, the vegetative to pre-flowering phase transition occurred at the seventh node, phylotoxic change at node 12, leaves with an even number of leaflets, for example, eight leaflets in white fiddle cultivar can be considered a sign of the transition to the flowering stage. And finally, the repression of oxygen-dependent pathway-related genes by epigenetic machinery may contribute to the recalcitrant nature of cannabis. Thank you so much for your undivided attention. Okay, so before I get to the questions there, um, some of the genomic and the transcriptonomic stuff went right over my head. And it's like you said, this information is kind of new. And no so where could somebody like myself what is a resource that I could tap into so that when I go back and I watch chapter two, I'll understand it better. Yeah. So, um, you could actually, most of these chapters are published. So you okay. can actually look up, uh, the papers themselves and give them a read through okay. for a uh, more in-depth analysis of, of what we, what we tried to convey. Right? That was pretty in-depth Marco. Like yeah. even reading the comments, 
So there's people that are like, and again, I now know why I was nervous. It's because you two are like how smart you are. And the whole entire, we're all buds, we're all buds here. <laughs> well, yeah. So the entire time I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, and I'd come up with a question like Philo taxi and the way your presentation was, you answered that question and, and it kind of flowed really nicely. I do want to get, I, so I know where my limitations are now and it's at the genes, but it's like you said, there's 18,000 of them to learn now. Is the cannabis genome mapped or are we still shooting blind and don't know how it really fits together? We have a reference genome for cannabis that we can map or transcribe from a catalog or RNA safe to an annotate with that reference genome. But unfortunately, as we mentioned in our first slide, the cannabis biology and cannabis genomics are in their infancy and there is a lack of reliable results in this area. We should improve the reference genome for cannabis, but we believe that as cannabis can get people high, also can get biology high. You know, because it's a very interesting plant with different characteristics, for example, it can be considered as a great model plan for a pure science and basic science regarding leaf phylotaxy and uh, leaf morphogenesis due to the wide range of leaf shapes in cannabis. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I have a feeling that you're the main individual writing everything for everybody. So I thank you, Dr. Hasami, for that. And, uh, Doctor in training, Peppy. When do you become a doctor? When's that happening? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> next year? Maybe next year. We'll see. We'll have to see. I still have to do all the mushrooms before I can finish. But uh, yeah, it's a long process. It really is. Um, being lucky enough to work with other doctors on Future Cannabis Project, like. It takes a lot of determination. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the questions that I was able to grab as we were going here. Um, I will start with this one. Where can beginners to tissue culture learn how and when to apply hormones? Oh, that's easy. We're, we're actually experts in uh, plant tissue culture. Thanks for this question, Ricky. Um, this is what we mainly focus on, actually, is plant tissue culture. Although this presentation was about plant tissue culture, this is our main expertise. Yep. Um, when to apply uh, hormones? You know, that's hard to say because each plant is different. Are, are you mainly talking about cannabis? Um, what we generally found in cannabis is that hormones don't really work too well in cannabis. Perform uh, multiplication. Multiplication. Yeah. Um, honestly, cannabis roots fairly easily in vitro too. Uh, what we found in general works best for cannabis is adjusting light and carbohydrate sources. And in this way, you can actually regulate the dynamic of internal phytohormones. So you don't have to use exogenous plant growth regulators. You know, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, you can influence them to do this type of thing on their own without adding exogenous uh, hormones in this type of thing. And we found, at least we found this works be better than uh, applying different uh, different hormones. What do you think, Rosa? It's a very difficult question. Yeah. I think because we have different types of tissue culture, one of them is shoot proliferation and multiplication, as Marco mentioned. Another one is direct regeneration, and uh, in direct regeneration, somatic embryogenesis, for example, we have no published uh, protocol for somatic embryogenesis, but somatic embryogenesis is very important in cannabis. If we have a protocol for somatic embryogenesis, it means that we can produce synthetic or artificial seeds. That is very important for the industry. And um, also we can, by having these types of protocol, we can do genome editing and gene transformation in cannabis. I mean that a stable gene transformation and genome editing in cannabis. And we, yeah, it depends on which 
growth of the tissue culture? Yeah, it's very difficult to answer answer that question. Uh, it's not a it's not a one answer question, right? So if you have any 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 more questions, Ricky, please feel free to email us. Yep. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Good answer. Uh, we're gonna go to Rotten. Uh, he asked this twice actually at the beginning of the presentation, and again now. Thank you, Travis. Uh, did light source have an, any impact on the study? morphology under sunlight versus HPS versus LED? So for the first part of uh, our experiment, I think we used fluorescent lights, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah and, and that's all we did. But um, we have actually a student working in our lab that's comparing, I think they're comparing uh, uh, metabolite profiles and trichome development in land race trays of cannabis between growing outside and growing indoors. So there, we should have a couple of publications on that coming out in the next couple of years. And specifically, uh, I think what he's looking at is uh, harvesting the resin glands for hash. So I think, I, and don't quote me on this, this is his project. Um, what he's gonna, he's one of the things he's trying to, trying to see is if um, for these land ray strains, if indoor or outdoor light is better for hash production, I think. Which is hmm. kind of interesting, but um, we only uh, use fluorescent light for this experiment. But generally, consider that light is only one factor. Right? There are lots of factors that influence uh, flower development, trichome development, and cannabinoid production. Generally, in medicinal plant, we generalize that considering biotic or abiotic stress resulting more uh, secondary metabolites. For example, in cannabis more cannabinoids. So there are lots of factors that can affect morphology. And, yeah. My personal opinion is uh, specifically for uh, cannabinoids and for um, different secondary metabolites, I'm all about the sunlight. I think sunlight is great for producing different types of terpenes, this type of thing. This is my opinion. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Because sunlight has a type of UV light. Yeah. And UV play important role in cannabinoid production. So all those people who are like, "Oh, indoor is way better," is like, I don't believe you one bit. <laughs> um, I'm not expertizing. Uh, I, I I like indoor because it's clean. That's right? true. Yes, but I love I love the sun because it's free, and you do get a better flower. You do like yeah. it, it's dirty, <laughs> but yeah so there's remediation techniques and ways that you can wash it so i think uh i don't disagree with you but again i'm limited to indoor so that's me yeah no, um, there's, there's there's various aspects that you can approach this lens by yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah and you're gonna get both answers right exactly. um so benjamin uh, first of all, shout out. He's been in the comment section, uh, talking lots about your papers. So he's a devout follower to you too. Um, his first question is, are there any known associations between the genomic regions, Loki or key QTLs of the genes you studied and measured traits like <laughs> cannabinoids or turpin profiles? Honestly, we only studied the leaf morphogenesis and phase transition in cannabis and we did a study flower development and trichome development in cannabis and cannabinoid production due to there's some limitation in our budget <laughs> all the academic uh, projects yeah but honestly I couldn't respond to this question sorry Benjamin if, you, if you want to if you're interested and you want to fund some research feel free to re reach out to us we're going to start a GoFundMe for you guys. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so Benjamin's next question. How could your development insights on phylotaxy, leaf morphology, and phase transitions be used to guide breeding decisions? Are there specific traits or markers breeders should focus on? For sure. Yep. So essentially... Um, in the number of leaflets. Yeah, even number of leaflets... Um, this is a, a key determination of maybe, you know, when to up your light intensity, when to, you know, change around your photo period, but also um, the determination of the pre-flower, right? This is, this is a good indication of when you want to change your dynamics, right? 
and, and this has a uh, such a this could be applied to different things like fast breeding methods right yeah. if you want to produce uh, seeds in a really fast time frame this could be applied in this way uh, but one important thing when we talk about the breeding uh, in fact in our mind we consider lots of cultivars consider that we only study one cultivar white widow yes. so or a study is only for white widow and in consider or conditions for example in many studies they change the photo period after two weeks or three weeks from a line day to the short day but we kept the plan in a line day photo period for around two months because we want to study only developmental biology in cannabis but regarding our results we believe that there are some signs such as even number of leaflets for example in white widow eight uh, leaflets can be considered a clear developmental sign for flowering and also regarding single flower as transition from the uh, adult vegetative to pro yeah. pre-flowering pre stage yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. Final question from Benjamin. Beyond okay. specific genes and mechanisms, what broader insights from your de uh, developmental and calogenesis studies could be or could guide cannabis breeding programs and strategies? Thank you, Benjamin. I like it. Thanks, Benjamin. That's a great question. Honestly, you know, when we talk about breeding, we talk about in a very broad area. We have different types of breeding, conventional breeding, and also I'm interested in uh, genome editing and genetic engineering as a sub-branch of the breeding. Regarding collagenesis, we found that epigenetic play an important role in repression of somatic embryogenesis. Right now, we have different types of genome editing. One of them is CRISPR-A, for example, CRISPR activation, and CRISPR-I, CRISPR interference, and epigenome editing. By using all of these tools of a CRISPR-Cas9 system, we can change the epigenetic status of cells. If we change the epigenetic status of cells, it means that we can activate the transcription factors. And activation of transcription factors such as BBM, Boschel genes, and others can activate or can express the somatic embryogenesis related genes. As I previously mentioned, if they have a protocol for somatic embryogenesis, first of all, we can produce synthetic or artificial seeds. That is very important for cannabis industry. Another important thing that we can, by having a somatic embryogenesis protocol, it's very easy to do genome editing yeah. for and uh, gene, gene transformation in cannabis. Regarding these types of breeding methods in cannabis, yeah, that is a great result. Yeah. But regarding conventional That's breeding, breeding honestly, yeah. I'm not a breeder. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So I now know where my downfall and what I need to learn more about. Um, 18,000 genes, eh? And we have no idea what any of them really does. So it, uh, I got to thank you for this because it's kind of a humbling thing. You know, I'm one of those guys that it's been growing their own cannabis for quite some time. So I tend to get a little bit jaded and, you know, oh, I know everything. And so it's nice getting these humbling experiences. Um, so your research papers, people can reach out to you on LinkedIn, uh, yourself, Dr. Asami and Marco, and you guys will get in touch with them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We provide our uh, email addresses uh, throughout the PowerPoint yeah. presentation. In the first so, slide and also in the last slide. Yeah. 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 And I've got your LinkedIn links on the comment yeah. section here. So. And also if anyone interested in any types of these types of research, he or she can reach out or supervisor professor max jones and yeah and we can discuss more nice nice um i don't know if there's any more questions coming in from the comments uh yes mr toad thank you ben thank you 
Um, coming up shortly, either on channel one or channel two, uh, Josh has got breeder Steve coming in. Uh, that's going to be an amazing conversation. And then tomorrow at lunch, uh, Jeremy Klecki's here with Aaron Appleby. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Travis. Thanks to everybody else in the chat. On that note, I'm going to roll credits and I will see everybody later. Oh.